And if you'll please join me in prayer. Lord, thank you for the scriptures and the promise that any word from your mouth will not return to you empty. Please open our hearts and minds to receive your word. May your spirit guide Pastor Paul as he speaks on your word, and may we take both with us throughout our week so that your love and word may spread to all those around us and accomplish what you please. In Jesus' name, amen. Second reading today is taken from the book of Luke. Now, on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all the things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are! And how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us? While he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us, that same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the word of the Lord. Isn't it interesting how some people think they got Jesus all figured out and then he surprises them? How stupid can those people on the road to Emmaus be to not know what's going on? We say, and yet, how often do we do the very same thing? We think we got Jesus figured out and then he goes and shows us something we never expected, had never seen, even though we had all the pieces of the puzzle. The women who had followed Jesus and knew Jesus, they had gone to the tomb prepared for a dead body. Jesus' disciples hid behind locked doors because they were afraid they'd be killed. 
in the name of the one who had said he would be raised on the third day. <laughs> Later than events of today's scripture that we talked a little bit about last week, Saul, the man of impeccable religious credentials, the greatest persecutor of Christians, has his come to Jesus moment on the road to Damascus. <laughs> and he becomes a Christian himself. And indeed, one of the great evangelists. You know, I've become more and more convinced in my life, and you might decide whether or not this is appropriate to you, that sometimes my complacency and the things I think I know mislead me. <laughs> that they are sometimes and often the greatest obstacles in my life and in my faith. Because we... Settle for so little, I believe, when God offer us, offers us so much. Now, how many of you, when you pulled out of the driveway this morning, shifted your car into drive, or if you had a manual transmission, went up to the gears, rather than just leaving it in first gear? That'd be pretty stupid, right? You'd probably still be on the way here. If you did that, you'd be settling for far less than your car has to offer, but it's been there the whole time. How often do we do that in our faith? Those books that we've never read sat on the shelf. <laughs> they just take up space, even though they may have something important to offer us. Sometimes, particularly for those of us who have gone to school and stuff think that what we know about Jesus is all that there is failing to take into account what he actually said <laughs> we sing the songs but do we actually let them live within us you know I pray for myself other pastors and all of us who know something about Jesus that we won't get so caught up in what we think that we don't look beyond what we think we know, that instead God would lift our eyes up to see beyond where we've always gone, what we've always done, and where we thought we'd always be heading. <laughs> because truly I believe that the pews of the churches are a fertile grounds for evangelization, that we need to hear the good news. Or maybe we need to truly experience it and not just say the words. You know, John Wesley is a great example. Um, he's well-educated, experienced, passionate, and a committed minister of the gospel ordained in the church he was highly dedicated to seeking holiness in his life and in his heart. And when he was at going to Oxford as a student, he and his brother formed a holy club for people that were passionate to live out God's intention for their lives. He was at the founding of the Methodist denomination that we know today. And everyone would describe John Wesley as an amazing and faithful Christian and Christian minister. But he discovered later on that there was a lot more. He had been ministering in England, felt a call to go to Savannah, Georgia, as a missionary, particularly to the Native American people. But on the way there, they hit a tremendous storm. The wet, you know, I started thinking of Gilgas Island just that moment. The weather started getting rough, but the tiny ship was tough. No. Because it wasn't for the spirit of John Wesley, because the crew and most of the passengers thought they were going to die. But there were a group of Moravian Christians who were calm and chill about it. They had a peace. They weren't ignorant. They knew what was going on but they knew the one who held their lives in their hands 
and they knew that death didn't get the final word and his John Wesley's experience of terror he saw the contrast with the peace of these other Christians and he knew there was a gap between what they knew about God's intentions for them and what he knew he's accomplished so much he knew so much he's going to be a missionary and yet there was something he had not experienced after a very difficult experience as a missionary in America John reluctantly went back to church service in England but after hearing uh, some words spoken by a speaker and engaging Martin Luther's um, introduction to the epistle of the Romans John Wesley writes in his dictionary I felt my heart was strangely warmed I felt I did trust in Christ alone for salvation, that he had taken away my sins. It was becoming personal, even mine, and he saved me from the law of sin and death. He had taught these things to other people all of his life. But he discovered that God had far more in store for him than he ever asked or imagined, that it was bigger and better than he dared believe. He had a moment where God had opened his eyes to see not just the Christ he had studied, the Christ he had taught, but a Christ he could know and experience his salvation. Well, two men are walking seven miles from Jerusalem to the village of Emmaus shortly after Jesus' death and on the way they're talking about things because they knew what happened in Jerusalem they were there <laughs> but they were about to discover what really happened instead of what they thought had happened over and over again people who thought they knew about Jesus were always surprised to discover that there was far more to Jesus than they dared to ask or imagine because tragic events had filled their last week. Jesus had entered into Jerusalem triumphantly. He was already cleaning house at the temple. But then he got turned over to the Romans. The crowd shouted to crucify him. And perhaps they caught a glimpse of Jesus himself on the cross, suffering and dying. These two were on the road going home, back to the way things had been. The party was over, lights out the end. Someone probably said, Jesus has left the building. People were in shock. Jesus didn't do what they expected him to do. Their dreams were shattered. And they were returning to their homes. And I imagine that they were returning to their lives as it had once been. What they expected did not happen. However, what they did not expect actually had happened, hadn't it? In a similar way, I believe that our expectations, the things that we think we know, keep us from seeing the things that Jesus would tell us, the things he would show us. We expect we'll be happy if God does what we want God to do for us. When instead, God's kind of saying, do things my way and you'll discover eternal treasures. Let's face it, you know, we'd rather have the opportunity to prove that getting rich wouldn't spoil us <laughs> rather than for God to reveal to us the joy and meaning of humility and lives of service. These people on the road to Emmaus had dreams and expectations they explicitly say they expected Jesus to be the one that would redeem Israel, that would return Israel to the way it was intended to be with God alone as its ruler, rather than living under hierarchies 
of Roman emperors and governors and military. They wanted things to go back to the way it was in the good old days, like under King David or King Solomon, when God would smite Israel's enemies. <laughs> that God would raise up a leader, a great leader, to lead them against the forces that kept Israel from being the, clearly the people of God. The problem wasn't that they had these expectations, but the problem was that they expected too little once again. According to their expectations, Jesus had failed. Instead of Jesus getting rid of the Romans, it looked like the Romans got rid of Jesus. And what these disciples expected wasn't what had happened. Jesus didn't lead a mighty army. Instead, it was a handful of soldiers from the Roman army that pounded nails in its flesh. Rather than purifying Israel's worship, it was corrupt religious leaders that turned on Jesus and threw him under the bus. Rather than Israel rising up above the nations, Jesus was laid in a borrowed tomb. <laughs> the men were on their way back home, back to the way things had been, it was like their computer had crashed and they needed to do a reboot. As they travel, a man asks, hey, what you all talking about? What, what's happening? You know, they, it's kind of amazing that their jaws drop and they go, who is this dude? Where's he been? Everyone knows what's been going on with this Jesus stuff. They don't, everyone knows what's happened over the last couple days. How has this guy not heard? But here's something really important, I believe, that those of us who think we know something about Jesus need to pay a lot of attention to. What does Jesus do when he realizes they don't really know what happened yet? Does he chew them out and tell them how wrong they were? Does Jesus immediately launch into a lecture explaining the theology of the resurrection as well as how they got it wrong? So what would Jesus do when he runs into some people who misunderstood something as fundamental as the resurrection? Well, even here, Jesus does the unexpected. Amazingly, the freshly risen Christ listens to people who have it wrong. He just doesn't leave them in the dust. He doesn't call them names. He listens to people who misunderstood. <laughs> it's how, you know, it's amazing. Yeah, I, I know for myself and for others how tempted we are to just start talking when we find people we disagree with. Or when we think other people misunderstand Jesus. We want to start flapping our lips. But what does Jesus do here? He listens. You know, someone tritely points out that God gives us two ears and one mouth, and Jesus lives out this proportion. Here is Jesus freshly risen from the grave, and what does he do? He listens. He listens to their story. He listens to their questions. He listens to their pain and to their doubt. And then only after listening does Jesus speak. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Someone once said, seek first to, be, to understand and only then to be understood. After listening, Jesus begins to unwrap Moses and the prophets. Things that these two men knew about because they recognize what he is speaking from. He's taking the dots, the, he's taking the data that, that is in their brain and showing it how, how it reveals something new and something different. He uses what they know to reveal to them what they had never seen. It had always been there, but they had never understood it yet. It was there in front of them all the time, but they missed it. What are we missing about Jesus that's right there in front of us? 
I'll bet you that Jesus could come up with a long list, and I thank God that he listens to me, and I thank God that he begins to explain himself. And then there's the moments where my eyes are, my heart, and my life are opened. Because our short-sighted expectations are often the thing that's the obstacle to our faith. They get between us and God's grace and His love. We expect too little, and we seek far less. Most of us would be happy with an uncomplicated life, a reasonable place to live, maybe cable TV, go out to eat every so often, just basic needs and comfort living. God has a lot more in store for you than that. When God offers us a life, and living that raises far beyond the storms of life that could give us peace even when facing death you know we'd like to win the lottery when god is offering us something that wealth can never buy we'd like to live lives of leisure when jesus calls us to something far more satisfying and of eternal worth our ultimate fear may be death. When in Jesus, the death of our bodies is a birth into a new life. Now that said, the folks on the road occasionally get some things right. And your being here this morning means that you're seeking something. Because when they reach the, their destination in Emmaus, they just didn't say, I hope you have a good evening. What's your name? <laughs> enjoyed, enjoyed walking with you. No, they invite him to their house. They invite a stranger to come home with them and to have dinner. They showed hospitality despite their disappointment, despite their disillusionment. They're loving their neighbor as themselves. They're loving someone and providing for them that they didn't know if they would see again. Then they're surprised again. They expected to share a meal with a stranger, with a person who will keep on walking to some other destination. Instead, they recognize the one who had been with them the whole time that they did not know. As T Jesus takes the bread, does sound familiar? He blesses it, he breaks it, and he shares it with them. And it says, in this, their eyes were opened and they recognized Jesus. And mysteriously, he vanishes from their sight. But they had seen the risen Christ in their lives, in their faith, would never be the same. Mission accomplished. Jesus revealed how all those pieces to get fit together. What they had expected Jesus to be was far too little. But now their eyes are open and their words are ch worlds are changed. They had known the, law, the words of Moses and the prophet, but now they know what it truly means because they showed hospitality to a stranger. That stranger was revealed to be Jesus himself. Jesus reveals himself to them. He also reveals that what they thought was once defeat is instead victory. <laughs> May that be true for us in seeing certainly the resurrection of Jesus as that great victory. But also may that bring life to the dead parts of our lives that we would know and recognize the risen Christ ourselves. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.